I'll try to make it quick. I was um, a Seventh Day Adventist for I'm 17 years old, so I just um, like a week ago kind of told my parents and everything that I'm an atheist, and they're both very religious people. They're both um, Seventh Day Adventists. I don't know if you guys know about that religion. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so um, it's the uh, you know they're not like some I guess radical Baptists. In a way, you know, they don't march up and down the street, um, you know, with anti-gay signs and stuff like that. But they are, um, I don't know, I guess they're kind of different. Um, so I was having a conversation with, um, I don't want to name them or anything. That's fine. But I was having a conversation with um, a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was talking about how the dating system, uh, about dating dinosaur bones and stuff is, incorrect and how scientists um their the dating system they do or whatever is not right and they can't actually you know say that oh this is millions of years old so that proves that the earth is this old and all of that stuff and that since they can't do that or since that it's in, he doesn't accept that idea then he says that leaves room for the um the god theory as he said it leaves room for this other um theory and so i was like okay but that still doesn't prove that god exists so i was wondering like what welcome to our last call right. Right. <laughs> wow i'm sorry I, I talked over you during that last sentence because it's just so appropriate based on the last call we had but what was your summary there um it was just kind of like what do i say to someone who just doesn't accept that what the testing methods are is incorrect well sometimes it, it's tough, but sometimes you have to accept the fact that regardless of what you say, you're not going to change someone's mind because they have such an emotional investment in the position that they're in, right? Uh, I feel like I'm less emotionally invested in my position of atheism because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like, when I die, it's over with. So, like, I, I feel like there would be mm-hmm. more motivation for me to stick with a religion if I was a religious person. I'm not necessarily emotionally attached to being atheist. It's just kind of what I figured out I think is true about the world. So at some level, you have to accept the fact that a lot of times, no matter what your best argument is, you're not going to change somebody's mind. And except that sometimes that's the position that you're going to get to. And aside from that, honestly, I think just do as much reading as you can. Learn as much about it as you can. So because a, a lot of times I think people make the mistake of automatically assuming that the person they're speaking with is uninformed. And you can demonstrate, even if you don't get the other person to believe you, you they can come away with the conversation like, wow, that person really knew what they were talking about. And maybe that gives me something yeah. to think about. And so I, I think that's an important p- place to start. Um, here's a good thing, though, just to let you know. There's a website called talkorigins.org. And it's very important to do mm-hmm. the .org or you'll end up somewhere not safe for work. So <laughs> talkorigins.org basically responds to questions like the ones we've been addressing with the other callers, right? Like Flat Earth and... Um, Noah's Ark and the global flood, and that deals specifically with the scientific rebuttals, right? So people that want to go there and yeah. want to do the science, you know, I'm going to sit and argue science with you. To me, uh, if you want to argue about the science of it, you should go find a scientist to argue with, and then come to us, you know, once you've changed the mind of scientists. But for you, if you if you actually like what Callie is saying, someone comes to you and says these dating methods are not okay, and you're like, wow, is that true? The best thing you can do is go look it up and say, wow, is that true? And go and check a site like Talk Origins where they're going to talk about, you know, what is, what is the scientific support for the dating methods. And then you can read that and you can see if you agree that they are non-robust, right? Like, are these dating methods um, useful? Are they not useful? Are they reliable? Are they not reliable? When are they reliable? When are they not reliable? Um, because not all of these dating methods work in all circumstances. So... You sh- I agree with Callie that, you, that a good thing to do is kind of go and look yourself and say, okay, so they're telling me that th- these dating methods don't work. Let's go see wh- whether or not they do. And talkorigins.org is like a clearinghouse where you can go and get like a lot of information sort of put together that is directly dealing with um, creationist claims and versus that, that tend to go against scientific consensus. And it basically will tell you, here's what the science has to say about it. And then you can make a decision about whether or not um, you think that that's supported. And I would also consider that uh, 
like, like we did with some of the previous callers. So, okay, let's assume that you're correct. Let's give you the argument that you're making. How does that demonstrate that God exists? You know, we can say that yeah. if we assume that argument is true, maybe it's slightly more likely that God exists, maybe, depending on which specific argument you're talking about. But let's assume that's true. How does that demonstrate God? Maybe that just demonstrates that scientists have looked at the question and gotten things wrong, which science does all of the time. That doesn't mean that science is wrong. Right, but I guess the point that, that she's making is that they're telling her, well, this opens the door for God. But right. the fact is, science doesn't even have to be wrong to, if, for this guy to open the door for God, right? There are mm -hmm. certain things that we do not know in science, and, and uh, frankly, lots of theists just go there, right? We don't have an answer to this, and therefore that opens the door for God. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know this, and um, therefore, so even if, and that's kind of how I see this, the scientific claims to me are, are kind of secondary, because you could sit and argue about them if you want, and you could say the dating methods are correct, but in the end, he could just flee to whatever science hasn't answered and say, let me plug in my God of the gaps yeah. there. And so all he's trying to do, which is kind of doing it the hard way, the easy way is just go to the gap and say, <laughs> right. God. But what he's doing is he's trying to make a crack. He's trying to build right. a gap first and then insert his God. Yeah. And, I, and I think part of, part of what he, maybe not consciously, right? I, I'm not saying that he's doing this on purpose, but I think part of that process is not just to insert the God somewhere, but the way he's doing it also then tries to shake the foundations of, of uh, whether or not you can rely on science. Right, so what he also, the benefit yeah. of doing it the way he's doing it is to say, don't trust science. But the question is, if we don't trust a scientific dating method, what is his method of dating? And how is it reliable? Okay, so how old is he saying these dinosaur bones are? And how does he know this? And how is he getting his data? Yeah. Because he has no better methods, I can guarantee you. If he does, he needs to talk to some scientists and he needs to get them, you know, show them how to improve their methods. Yeah. And so and there he, are he doesn't know either. Yeah, there are um, a lot of, well, not a lot, I don't know, but there's, you know, Christian scientists. And so um, I guess he's kind of trying to rely on what they believe and uh, the Christian scientists. And so he's always telling me like, well, people who are scientists, they always make fun of and like they pick on the Christian scientists as if it's like a high school bullying type thing. And I don't see why he's always trying to make them kind of like the victims and trying to make them seem like, well, these guys always get picked on, so they must be telling the truth. And hey, no, I, uh, yeah. no. So first yeah. of all, you know, most people are theistic even in scientific communities, like especially in the United States. So it, it, there are less theists among certain sciences, but the fact is you still have lots and lots of theistic people even in, in the science fields. Well, and the thing to point out with that too is that what you see a lot of times people arguing for creationism, you, they point out like, well, I have a PhD in whatever my PhD is in, but they're making a comment on a field that's not relevant to their degree. So they're saying like, well, I'm a geologist, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna talk to you about why evolution isn't true because of organic chemistry. And so, I mean, if you're trying to to poke holes in someone's right. worldview, like obviously you don't want to step in and like pre pretend you're an expert because that's what you're well, that's what you're criticizing these folks for doing. But I think that's an important thing to point out too. And then I think another important question to ask, it, it, because what we're kind of circling around is the God of the gaps, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, therefore God. Mm -hmm. And the question I always like to ask people is why is God the answer instead of I don't know? And, yeah. and that goes back yeah. to the like, oh, atheists are arrogant. Well, I would rather just say I don't know. Or even in the case of what you're dealing with, which isn't a therefore God, but more of a therefore maybe God. Right, therefore right? maybe And I'm God. kind of like, how do you even know it's, you know, maybe God? Like, uh -huh. wouldn't there, if we're gonna say God might be the cause, wouldn't the next question be, well, okay, then we need to demonstrate there is a God because only things that exist or have existed can be the cause of other things. And so if, we, if, we, if we're going to assert that, hey, a God is causing this, the next question is, great, how do we model and demonstrate and you know, test for this God to see that yeah. it exists and can interact and do things in the ways that you're describing? But, the, but I guess to me, the whole point is, why would we insert any any cause for which we don't even have a demonstration of existence, past or present, with I don't know, right? Even if someone thought yeah. it could be a God, I would think that if that person was acting in good faith, their next thing would be to say, I'm, and I'm gonna demonstrate that my God is, exists and is doing this. I'm gonna go find that way to, to demonstrate this, to measure this. 
but yeah. they'll say you can't, right? And it's, and it's not fair to ask somebody to measure God and then God becomes no more relevant than something that doesn't exist because you can't measure those things either. Yeah, um, I have one more question. It's not really about um, being atheist or anything. It's kind of about, I guess, liberals and um, so it's a show that I'm watching. It's um, I Am Jazz and it's about, you know, this trans teenager who is trying to get uh, reassignment surgery or um, she's trying to like, I guess, make her penis into a vagina. And so her doctor who's going to be doing the surgery said, okay, you need to lose 30 pounds of, for me to be able to do the surgery. And so uh, in one episode, she's complaining about why does she have to lose 30 pounds and she doesn't want to, and she's trying to work out, but then she'll get fat again. And so um, I know there's a lot of people, I've seen some videos on YouTube and debates about whether being fat has anything to do with being healthy. And a lot of people are saying there's fat discrimination and there's no link between, um, I guess, being overweight and versus being healthy. I was wondering what the guest view was on this, <laughs> I guess. I don't know if it has anything to do with being transgender, if she had to lose the 30 pounds or if it just for the surgery, she had to lose. This is a perfect that much question. Yeah, for no, Callie. this is great. I, I ha, so I had I had my I had bottom surgery seven months ago, and I I mm -hmm. went through that that exact experience, um, and uh, mm -hmm. so I I had I also had weight loss surgery about a year ago, and my surgeon gave me a specific weight to hit. And what what it's actually about is how safe it is to perform surgery because anesthesia is uh, effectively it's a doctor bringing you closer to the point of death and keeping you on the edge. I mean that's that's a really overly simplistic mm -hmm. way to. Explain it, but that's what anesthesia is, and it gets a lot more risky the heavier you are. And so that's that's mm -hmm. the argument. And how that ties back into uh, discrimination against fat people, that 100% exists because I weighed 403 pounds before I had my weight loss surgery. So I, I had very personal experiences with that kind of discrimination. And um, it, it, it's a tough... It's a tough line because a lot of times if you go to a doctor and you say, I'm having this health problem, the doctor automatically defaults to your fat, lose weight, even without any further yeah. examination. Um, I'm aware of a story where someone kept going to a doctor and saying, I'm having this specific kind of pain and it's happening a lot. And the doctor kept saying, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. And eventually this person found a doctor that listened to what they were saying. And it turned out they had a genetic problem that was, cause, that, that was causing problems with their nerves. It had absolutely nothing to do with their weight. But we know weight can be a health problem. Weight's not inherently a health problem, I think is what it comes down to. Because before my yeah. weight loss surgery, I was relatively healthy otherwise. I mean, I had some developing joint problems and like my blood tests, some of the levels were slightly off. But I was gen it is 100% possible to be a healthy person and overweight, um, but it can cause health problems. So there's, there's some nuance to the discussion there. Yeah. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of ways, okay. it's like anything. Like, um, for example, certain amounts of moderate drinking in uh, can cause increases in breast cancer rates. Mm -hmm. But that's the increase in breast cancer rates. It's, for example, one of the ways I think is a good way to explain it, right? So let's say that it causes a 30% increase in breast cancer rates, which I think is actually the percentage. I'd have to go and look to confirm, but that's what I seem to recall. It doesn't mean that if I drink, I have a 30% greater risk of breast cancer. It means that if me and a bunch of other women drink, we're collectively, like some of us at a rate of about 30% more, will end up with breast cancer as opposed to the other ones who don't seem to be affected by it as far as breast cancer, mm -hmm. right? So when somebody looks at being overweight, it's gonna be the same thing. Extra weight on some people is probably going to trigger certain other issues because of other things about their physical reality, right? What, who they are and how they're built and the, just like the genetic factors that go into them. Like not everybody that's heavy is gonna have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Some people that are heavy are gonna have horrible problems with sleep apnea. It just depends on, on the person and the other factors about them. Just because something increases risks doesn't mean it increases risk in the individual. It means it increases risk in that demographic. And so, the idea, I think, behind the, I, I, the concept of the weight and the health is just the, uh, that we have this, first of all, we have a, a real hate on for weight, <laughs> right? So it is sort of uniquely vilified as a thing that causes risk, 
So instead of somebody, yeah. if I have three glasses of wine, nobody is just like, oh my gosh, you're so unhealthy. Look right. at you. Drink. You know, the doctor doesn't say, you know, how much are you drinking? Three glasses of wine. Holy cow, three glasses of wine a week. You're, you're killing yourself. You really need to cut down. I mean, even though it does put me at a much higher risk of, of something that's killing a lot of people. So it, it, there is this, yeah. this discrimination just as the, as the cause of the risk, right? We judge in a harsh way. Mm -hmm. But the other reality is that for some people, putting on that weight isn't ever going to be a problem for them. And you can't tell unless yeah. you're looking at the individual and the problems that they're having, whether or not the weight would be an issue for them or not be an issue for them. And so some people are going to have issues with it. Some people aren't. And for the people that aren't, they are, they're, say, they're living their lives and they're being fine. They're not getting diabetes. They're not having sleep apnea. They're not, you know, it's so, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys have time for one more question or is that it? Um, we're getting a little late, but throw it out there if it's something we could do quick. Okay. Um, well, Adventists never really believe in hell. And so sometimes atheists or other people who you know, don't like the hell idea, they say, how can a God... Uh, torture and do all this stuff and that doesn't sound like a really you know good god or anything mm -hmm. but Adventists don't believe in hell so whenever someone would try to use that argument they can just quickly say well we don't believe in that either because that doesn't sound like a good god but then they accept other stuff about god but they don't seem that seems really harsh and um messed up so like how i don't never understood like i guess um, why not atheists in particular or other people keep on using the hell argument about how can a God do that or how can you believe in a God who um, would do that if, you know, some religions or specifically Adventism doesn't even believe in that so it doesn't really work with them. Well, I don't think I would use the hell argument with somebody if I knew up front that they didn't believe in hell. Yeah. I, I, oh, I think yeah. that would be kind of a ridiculous argument to use with that particular person. Yeah, well, like, I guess it's just overall, it seems like Adventists kind of switch, like, every year. I, I kind of joke sometimes um, with my sister because it seems like every year Adventists kind of, like, change their viewpoints just a little bit to kind of fit in with um, modern society. Yeah, and, that's like, not unique to Adventism. Adventism. Right. <laughs> The um well like I can only speak about that religion. Oh sure sure yeah I was just saying that's woman. that's yeah. that's definitely a common yeah. thing among yeah. faith traditions. Um, yeah so like the LGBTQ when that became like a really big um thing in the news and like a lot of that type of stuff was going on and people would look at religion and say well you know these are you know they discriminate and they publicly discriminate the kind of religions that go around uh marching in the streets but with adventists it seemed like there's a lot of uh a split within different churches and there's you know the younger people in their 20s and 30s were like moving on and they were actually breaking away from the church um and starting their own churches that did include lgbtq people and now it just seems like every big thing that comes up in the news or whatever adventists kind of switch their viewpoints on it and i don't see how they don't see the hypocrisy and like every year it seems like they're changing their minds about stuff and saying oh well god says that's just symbolism or he wasn't it, like they interpret it different every year so that it they don't have to feel like they're different from society like especially the young people i think the way that a church justifies a thing like that is that they basically say that god is always right and even if our understanding of what god is trying to communicate is wrong the god is still right so whatever the reality becomes is irrelevant because yeah. they can simply say oh and we misinterpreted the the bible on that and that's on us not on god yeah, well, and I think you did a really yeah. good job of, of articulating a problem with the way that many mainstream faith traditions operate, right? I mean, basically what you mm -hmm. said is you did the argument. They say, well, these things are universally true, and then you can point back and say, well, here are some things that were universally true and all of a sudden weren't. Uh, you know, that that's uh, you did a really good job of yeah. articulating why yeah. a lot of that doesn't make sense. And the question becomes, how do you know that what you believe right now is, is correct? And I mean, mm -hmm. that, that applies as well to, you know, even people that would adopt an evidence evidence-based view of, of reality, right? Because we could still, yeah. with incomplete evidence, you're going to have an incomplete uh, picture of things, mm -hmm. and you could be wrong on some aspects of it, and I understand that. But that doesn't mean that you throw the evidence out the window, because like I said before, with the, with the dating thing, what else do you have? 
right? right. It's like you kind of have yeah. to base your, your, your thoughts and your navigation of reality on something. And if you can't base it on evidence, then what can you base it on? Well, they say they're basing it on God, but what you're describing is really they're just basing it on the same evidence the rest of us are, and then they're just saying God. It's kind of like the guy that was trying to prove Noah's Ark, right? It's like he, he thinks that altering the reality somehow changes that problem and it doesn't. You still back up and say, why are you throwing in God? Whatever is the reality in front of you, why are you throwing in God? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your call, Samantha. Okay. I hope we were useful. Yeah, and best of luck in those conversations. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Okay, okay.